Welcome everyone to the webinar today. The, the topic is kidneys, what you should know. My name is Anjay Rastogi, I'm a kidney specialist and I'll be going over some information about kidneys and how, first of all, how you can be involved in your own care and, and some of the things that you can do to keep your kidneys healthy. So with that, um, there will be an option of asking questions uh, as, as we go along and at the end, time permitted, I'll try to answer as many questions as I can and if I'm not able to answer questions, we'll try to post them on our website as well. So with that, um, let's get some information about kidneys. Um, as you probably know, we have two kidneys. Um, they are actually in the back. They're below your rib cage, 9th, 10th, and 11th ribs. And the size of the kidneys, uh, the longest dimension is about 11 centimeters. So if you, 9 to 11 from here. And we do look at kidney size when we're looking at the disease states. Now these, these the two kidneys act as filters and they filter your blood. They ultrafiltrate, which eventually becomes urine passes through these two tube-shaped st structures called ureters, and, and then this urine eventually comes into this bladder. And, and it stays here for some time till you urinate, and then when you urinate, it will come out um, as, as urine. So that's, that's, and this is a cross-section of the kidney, the kidney cut open. I'll be going over that in a bit more detail as well. So what do your kidneys do? So kidneys are a very actually, complex organ, one of the most complex organs in your body, and they do a lot of functions, a lot of things. So we normally think of them as the organs that, that make urine, but it's actually more than just making urine. They get rid of waste products. They actually are involved in acid-base, fluid, and electrolyte balance as well. They're involved in drug clearance. So along with liver, kidneys are one of the main organs that actually process and get rid of drugs. And this is important to know because if your kidneys are not working at, at full capacity, then if the drug is cleared by the kidneys, then you have to dose it appropriately. And your pharmacist and your physician should be able to tell you that at what dose. But if they don't, please do let them know that your, your kidney function is actually not, not at full capacity and they probably will need to adjust the dose. The other function that kidneys do is what we call the hormonal functions. So kidneys are involved in a lot of hormonal functions. One is vitamin D processing. So vitamin D that you ingest is actually not active and, and it has to go through the kidneys to become active. So if your kidneys are not working properly, then no matter how much vitamin D you take, it will not do its work. And sometimes you have to give artificial vitamin D, which we call active vitamin D. They're also involved in blood cell production, especially red blood cells. So there's a hormone called erythropoietin that's, that's synthesized by the kidneys and acts on bone marrows and causes RBC production, that's red blood cells. And if your kidneys are not working properly, they, they, this hormone goes down and these patients tend to become anemic. So anemia is one of the manifestations of chronic kidney disease. And the third hormonal function that, that kidneys are involved is blood pressure ma maintenance. So there's a hormone called renin that's synthesized by the cells in the kidneys and is very central in maintaining blood pressure in, in the humans. So these are some of the functions of the kidneys. These are important to keep in mind because when your kidneys don't work properly, um, all these manifestations will, will come forward. Now, this is a cartoon of a nephron. So the nephron is a structural and functional unit of your kidneys. Each kidney is made about of a million nephrons. Now, there's a term I, I call myself as a kidney specialist, but there's another term that we use for ourselves, it's called the nephrologist. So nephrologist is the same term as a kidney specialist, and, and the term comes from nephron. We are also called renal specialist. So these are terms used interchangeably, renal, nephrologist, and kidneys. So let's look a bit more into the nephron. These are blood vessels. This red one is the artery, this is the vein, and they, this pumps blood into this cup-shaped structure called glomerulus. Now the blood vessels are important. Kidneys are one of the most vascular organs of the body, which makes sense, because kidneys act as a filter for the blood. But 25% of what your heart pumps goes to the kidney. So that's a significant one, one fourth uh, of, of what, what it pumps. So now why is that relevant? If the heart is not working properly, kidneys do get affected. So one of the major causes of kidney dysfunction is heart problems. So I think that's an important fact to keep in mind. The other point that I wanna mention over here is this cup shaped structure called glomerulus. So this is a filter. Like I mentioned, kidneys act as a filter. So the filtration happens at this cup-shaped structure called glomerulus. The ultrafiltrate then passes through the different segments of the nephron, it gets processed, and eventually comes out here 
as urine. Now here I, I want to mention is a, a test that we do for kidney function called GFR, which stands for glomerular filtration rate. So the term glomerular is over here, the filter, and the filtration rate is how good the kidneys are filtering. So that test is, is a, the best overall assessor how, how kidneys are working. So it's called GFR, and I'll be going over that when we discuss some testing that we do for kidney disease. Now, how do you know that you have kidney problems? So you can have different manifestations. One is you could have swelling. You can have swelling in your face. You can have swelling in your legs. You can have back pain. Like I mentioned, the kidneys are in the back below the 9th, 10th, and 11th ribs. So if you're complaining of back pain, one of the organs that we do look at is if the pain is coming from the kidneys. You can have blood in the urine. So, so a bloody urine is a sign that there might be problems with the kidneys. The other important thing is you can have decreased urine formation frothiness of urine. So frothiness of urine is also important. Um, it could happen for a lot of reasons, but one of the things that can lead to increased frothiness is protein. Now this filter that I mentioned uh, tries to retain all the good stuff in the blood and that includes protein. So when the filter is not working properly, a lot of these protein spills over. And this protein in the urine we, we use as, as a marker of kidney disease and we actually follow that on a regular basis to see how one is responding. But the most important thing is most of the kidney disease is, is asymptomatic, it's silent. And I think this is a very key point. So, so the, sometimes the only way you can find out that you have kidney problem is by doing a simple blood test or urine test, and sometimes even an ultrasound. So, so this herein lies the importance of your annual checkup. So even though if you're not having symptoms, you'd have your simple blood test, simple urine test test every year. Now, how do you assess kidney function? Like I mentioned, uh, it's asymptomatic, so, so in most of the cases, so you might not even show symptoms and might even not know they have a kidney problem. And this is important because early diagnosis and treatment is critical. So if you find a kidney disease early, you can actually revert it. But if it's more advanced, then it becomes very problematic. So a simple blood test, a urine test, and imaging studies like a simple ultrasound and if needed we do a biopsy in which you take a small chunk of the kidney tissue and look at it under microscope and do different kind of testings on it. Now in the blood test there is something that, that we focus on is called creatinine. So creatinine is, is, comes from creatine, it's, it's, it's actually not toxic but it's a marker of, of kidney disease and as your kidney function declines your creatinine goes up. Now from the creatinine, we, we check GFR. So this is the glomerular filtration rate, and this is probably the single most important test that we do for kidney disease. And then we, we check urine test uh, for protein especially. So we check urine for any blood, any, any red blood cells, white blood cells, but also for protein. And, and you probably have heard a term called albumin. So albumin is a, a specific and a special kind of protein. And we do that on a routine basis whenever the patients come. And like I said, if needed, we do imaging studies and do biopsies. So if your kidneys are injured, what happens? So broadly, there are two kinds of injuries. One is acute and the other is chronic. And today I'll be going more over the chronic problem rather than acute. The acute is you have an insult. Hopefully you, you catch it early enough. And, and since it's an acute, there's a pretty good chance that you can recover the kidney function if the insult is removed and you take care of, of the kidney injury. But in the chronic, it's a bit different. It's actually a progressive disease. And the goal here sometimes is to just to slow down the progression uh, and hopefully treat that as well. But, but it's, it's, it's slowing down the progression is, is our big focus. So we, we spoke about the kidney size. We spoke about the, so this is how your healthy kidney should look like. It's, it's about nine to 11 centimeters. It's smooth surface. Now when the kidneys are, are diseased, they tend to get shrunken. They get small and the surface gets a bit granular. There are a few exceptions to this, and one is called polycystic kidney disease. In that, the disease actually get bigger, but those are one of the few exceptions. But in most of the chronic diseases, the kidneys tend to shrink and get smaller in size. This is how we define chronic kidney disease. So if you have any abnormality um, from the kidneys, whether it be a low GFR, whether it be blood in your urine, whether it be cyst, whether it be protein, and if you have any evidence of this for more than three months, that's the cutoff, then, then you will be qualified and classified as having chronic kidney disease. Now this slide is important and, and here I just want to focus on a few things. So when we talk about, you know, not too long ago, 
there were two big groups of kidney patients, for chronic disease at least, the dialysis and the pre-dialysis. And, and that actually is not a good nomenclature because what, what the assumption we, we are making by calling them pre-dialysis is that they're going to end up on dialysis. And our goal is to prevent our patients from getting on dialysis or transplant. So what are we can do? So, we, so, so this is now called CKD stages. So there are five stages uh, starting from here. Your GFR is normal, that is above 90. And then it's stage two, stage three, stage four. And this is stage five. This used to be called ESRD, end stage renal disease, but now it's called CKD stage five. And in this uh, stage, our goal is to make sure that we have the right options for the patients, whether it be dialysis or transplant, and provide the best care we can. So one thing that I would like you guys to do today is look at your labs, look at your creatine, look at your GFR, and see what stage you fit in. Because the, the management depends upon which stage you're here. So if you're in the early stages, like stage one, two, three, and even early four, our job or our goal is to, to number one, slow down the progression and hopefully treat it. But once you get into stage f advanced four and five, our goal is actually to make sure that you have the right replacement therapy, which might be dialysis or transplant. So it depends upon which stage you're in and also the complications that happen with kidney disease depends upon which stage you're in as well. So now let's look at some of the, the things that can actually damage your kidneys. High blood pressure and diabetes are the two most common causes of patients ending up on dialysis in the US and the Western society. They account for more than 60 to 70% of all the cases. The third one, which you see has a very big center, is called PKD, polycystic kidney disease. And that's the third most common cause of patients ending up on dialysis. About five to 10% patients with, uh, five to ten percent patients who end up on dialysis actually have PKD as a cause. Drugs and medications are actually a very important cause and these are both prescribed and non-prescribed medications and I'll be going over that in my next slide in a bit more detail. Smoking is always a cardiovascular risk factor and what's, what's bad for your heart is bad for your kidneys and I think that's a very important and the, and the flip side is true as well. What's good for your heart is good for your kidneys. When, when people say um, what can I do to improve my, my kidneys? One of the things that we tell them is to improve your cardiovascular status, which includes diet, exercise, and all the good stuff that you want to do. Infections can affect. We have hep B, hep C, and any kind of infection can actually, and then a lot of immune problems. We have bloomer nephritis and all this. So this in summary, but as you can see, the, the, the big hitters are the first four ones. Um, and actually you can put the heart problems as well, but high blood pressure, diabetes, and polycystic kidney disease account for a good chunk of patients ending up. Now, drugs and medications are, are very important. Um, you know, they have a purpose. Uh, my other uh, degree is in pharmacology. Um, I'm a pharmacologist by training as well. And I always tell my patients to go over their medication list in, in, in a lot of detail because a lot of these medications can have potential harm. So when we prescribe a medication to a patient, it's always a risk versus benefits. And the benefits have to outweigh the risk. But sometimes you're put on medications that you probably don't need. Now, also the other assumption is if the drug is over the counter, uh, it's, it's, it is safe, and that's actually not true. A lot of the drugs that are over the counter are actually can be potentially very toxic, not just kidneys, but other organs as well. So the first one is the drugs that we commonly use for pain or fever called the non-steroidals. And this is a whole big class that includes ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, naproxen. So basically any painkiller besides Tylenol that's over the counter probably belongs to this, this class. And this class of drug is potentially harmful to your kidneys, is harmful to your heart, and also blood pressure. So, so we actually try to minimize as much as we can. A short course is okay, but long term um, is, is definitely puts you at higher risk. And you should definitely talk to your healthcare provider about these medications. The other one that has gotten a lot of attention is called PPIs. These are the proton pump inhibitors. These are class of drugs that you take for acid. And, and if you look at the label, there's always, it's for a short term, unless your healthcare provider gives you it for, for a longer course. So if you're in any of these medications, there are a whole bunch of them, make sure that there's a good reason why you're taking that. Because there have been some associations, at least, that we know between kidney disease and other disease and organs and, and this class of drug. So PPIs is another big class of drug that you have to be careful. Herbal supplements, and a lot of my patients bring the herbal supplements and they said, can I, can I take it? And, and my answer to them, I don't know, because I don't know what's inside them. I don't know what, what, what they do. So if I'm giving, giving you advice, I, I'm basically um, not telling you based on what I know and just, just 
trying to, to, to speculate. So, so the short answer is be very cautious when you take any herbal supplements. There's actually a disease called Chinese herb nephropathy. It's actually a disease condition that has happened with some of these herbal medications. Also, these herbal supplements can have, have agents or compounds that cause drug interactions. So that's also something important to keep in mind. We talked about renal dosing. So, so if the drug is cleared by the kidneys and, and your kidney is not working at full capacity, then the dose has to be adjusted. Um, and your pharmacist and your physician should help you with this. The other thing that I want to go over is contrast, especially the contrast, the intravenous contrast. So when you do a CAT scan, CT scan, or do angiograms, like a cardiac angiogram, they, they inject dyes in you, and these dyes are potentially toxic to your kidneys. So number one, they, you, should, you should try to avoid them as much as you can, but if, if there's no way to avoid them, then, then make sure that, that your healthcare provider takes due precautions, which includes hydration and some of the stuff, and minimizing the amount of dye they put in to, to minimize the, the toxicity. The other one is MRIs, the gadolinium contrast that we use. So the GAD contrast with, with MRIs, it's not that much toxic to the kidneys, but it can cause other problems. So if your kidneys are not working properly, then you should be very cautious about getting any intravenous contrast with MRIs. So once again, talk to your radiologist and talk to your nephrologist and healthcare providers what you can do and is it absolutely needed. Now, if your kidneys are not working properly and CKD stands for chronic kidney disease, what can happen? As I mentioned, epogen is, is or erythropoietin synthesized in the kidneys. The, these patients tend to get anemic and they also tend to get iron deficient. Uh, most of the patients with kidney disease, when they become iron deficient, it's because they can't absorb iron properly. And in these cases, we tend to give iron intravenously. And what you should check for is, uh, and they, I'll actually, I'll be going over this, bone mineral disease, malnutrition, acidosis, cardiovascular disease, and hypertension. So, so let's talk about high blood pressure. Um, you should ask your physician what is the goal. Of, of your um, uh, uh, blood pressure. Is it 140 over 90? Is it 130 over 80? Different patients have different go goals based on their age, depending upon the comorbid conditions, but that's the first question you should ask. The second thing is, the if you think about it, um, the blood pressure readings, the, the clinic readings are, are the worst readings you can have. The best readings, short of the 24-hour blood pressure monitor, is home reading. So I strongly, most of my patients have blood pressure monitors. They're not that expensive. You keep them at home and you can check, just, but just make sure that you know how to take blood pressure properly. And if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to, to email me. The drugs, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, that's a class of drugs that we prefer. Salt intake, a big culprit in blood pressure. And most of the salt is a hidden salt that you don't, are not aware of when you go out or, or it, it's in preservatives. That's something that you have to be extra cautious about as well. So blood pressure control is very important. We spoke about anemia and iron. Check your hemoglobin, check your, your iron status. And if you are deficient, then your physician or nephrologist will help you uh, get. The other point that I do want to mention is, which I didn't, is when do you refer the patient to a nephrologist as early as you can, but especially if you're in advanced stage three, and definitely by stage four, you should be seen by a kidney specialist. Bone disease is highly prevalent, so when we say a patient has kidney disease, there are two other things that they have by, by, by association. One is a heart problem, and the other is bone disease. And to, to monitor your bone disease, we check vitamin D levels, we check calcium, phosphorus, and a hormone called PTH, parathyroid hormone, is also checked. And, and once again, your kidney specialist will be going over these. So the reason why I'm mentioning all these labs is you should actively follow these labs. And I, I always tell my patients is to get a printout or you can go to my UCLA Health and, and look at the labs and trend them. So trends are more important sometimes than absolute values and see and then ask your, your healthcare provider, ask your kidney specialist what these labs actually mean. So getting more involved in your, your, your own care. Now acid load. The important point over here is that the kidneys get rid of acid, and if your kidneys don't work properly, your acid tends to build up. A Western diet that high, is high in meat tends to have a much higher acid load, and this acid load has really negative consequences on your overall health. So you have to make sure that you're not acid, and this is not the, the stomach acid we're talking about. This is the acid in your blood, and you have to make sure that that, that is taken care of. And the, the lab that we check for is called the bicarbonate, and it's, it's TCO2 if you look at your chemistry panel, and the magic number is 
22 or above. So we definitely want this TCO2 or serum bicarbonate levels to be 22. And that's one of the single most important thing you can do to, to actually to, to minimize the damage caused by kidney disease is to make sure the acid load does not build up. And this, I'll go back to the plant-based diet. The animal-based diet is, is, puts a big acid load on your body. So, and, and, and the, and the plant-based diet is actually much better in that case. Electrolytes, we should check potassium. Most of the kidney patients tend to run high potassium levels, which cause hyperkalemia. But also, you have to keep in mind, some patients actually might have low potassium. And low potassium can be equally bad as high potassium. So, so you have to make sure that, that your potassium is within the normal range. And the normal range depends upon your lab. So it should not be too low and it should not be too high. You should also monitor sodium, calcium, and, and phosphorus. So calcium. And the other other electrolyte that's not mentioned over here is magnesium. That also should be should be checked on a regular basis. Fluid, we talked about water. Now here, a point that I want to make is, so we normally talk about fluid restriction and water restriction, but what's more important is salt. Because salt, when you eat too much salt, it does two things. Number one, salt tends to retain water in your body. And the second thing is that salt actually stimulates thirst, so you'll drink even more water. So, so I tend to focus more on salt than limiting water restriction. But once again, this you should talk to your healthcare provider and see what guidance they're, they're giving you as far as how much fluid you can drink. The other question that we get asked a lot about is clinical research and studies. Uh, there are a lot of disease states that, that don't have a disease-specific drug. And for that, we do a lot of studies. UCLA is, is a prime site for clinical studies. And if you're interested in doing one, please do reach out to us. Uh, uh, if my office is doing the study, we can, we can see if you qualify. If our office is not doing the study, but there are other studies going on, we can connect you with them. And, and these research studies have the unmet need. They advance the field. Uh, these, all these studies are, are reviewed and have to be approved by UCLA's IRB, which is an institutional review board, and also by FDA. And, and some of the things that, that people don't realize because they think that they're being guinea pigs. But they, these drugs are, are, once again, risk versus benefits. And the hope is that there's much more benefit than risk with these drugs. And also, the care that they get in clinical trials is always exceptional. And at the end, you're also giving back to society. Because a lot of drugs that you're on now, somebody went through these clinical research and studies. So to summarize the, the care that, that a kidney patient should get, the first one, as Wright mentioned at the top, is is early detection of chronic kidney disease. So that, that's early diagnosis and treatment. And in most of the cases, it's by simple blood tests and urine tests. So getting that done on a routine basis. Once you, you have the diagnosis, then the key goal is to delay progression. Slowing down progression, you add drugs like ACE inhibitors, blood pressure control, blood sugar control, protein, adequate amount of protein. We want to prevent any complications. We talk about anemia, bone disease, acidosis, malnutrition treat the comorbid conditions, whether it be heart problems, vascular disease, diabetes. And if you've done everything you can and you still advance, then we, we prepare them for what we call RRT, which stands for Renal Replacement Therapy. And here we, we sit down with the patient and give them their options, uh, both dialysis and transplant, and including living donor transplant and home dialysis. So, so these are things that we go over in detail with the patients so they have. But this takes time, and, and we want to make sure that this is not something they, we rush into. Now, how to keep your kidneys healthy? Uh, diet is very important. Eat, eat the right diet, healthy diet, no fried food and stuff like that. But also a plant-based diet has been shown over and over again to be more kidney friendly than something that's more meat-based. Water intake uh, is very important um, and the kidneys don't like to get dehydrated. So, so talk to your physician. Uh, if your kidneys are working properly, you should drink, drink enough fluid. But if they're not working properly, then talk to your physician and see what, what is the right amount of water that you can drink. Exercise, smoking should be inhibited. Blood pressure and diabetes management, very important. A healthy heart. And then obviously be careful about the medications you're taking because some of these medications can be very toxic to your kidneys. Now, if you're interested in getting more information uh, about transplantation, including living kidney donation, UCLA is is a very big transplant center. If you're interested in home dialysis, um, then, then and that's the, the other thing that, that UCLA is very big in. If you're interested in clinical research, and last but not the least, 
if you are interested in supporting the core kidney program uh, in, in any capacity doing outreach with us, please let us know. We'll be very happy to get you more involved in, in our program. This is our contact information. This is our website, the uclahealth.org slash core kidney. This is our email, corekidney at mednet.uc.edu, and this is our phone number. So we'll be very happy to help you and support you in whatever we can. And this is what our website looks like. As you can see, there are all the clinical programs, the PKD Center, the health fair, our expert team. You can ask questions here as well. So you can go to this website, ask the questions, and we'll try to get back to you in a reasonable amount of time. And this is our core kidney website again. So in summary, learn more about kidneys so you can be your own best advocate, be an active participant in your care. Let us know what you would like to hear more. Do give us feedback and support our programs as much as you can. And I'll end this with a line that I learned in medical school. Your eyes see what your brain knows. And, and what you don't know might hurt you. And knowledge is power. So with that, I'll end my talk. And I know there are some questions. And I'll be very happy to answer them. So. So uh, the first question is, there is frequent urination. Should I be concerned? And the answer is, is uh, if you're drinking a lot of fluid. So if you're drinking a lot of fluid, then you, you will be you know, going to the bathroom a lot. But if you're not, then, then it's important that you let your healthcare provider know. Now here, the, the problem might not be with the kidneys. It might actually be with the bladder or even below that. So this definitely needs to be addressed. And it's also not how frequent. Um, are you actually also um, have some problem in the urine? So a urine test, and sometimes this comes from either bladder irritation or, or bladder infection. So those things should be ruled out. The next question is interesting. Is, is any alcohol always bad for kidney? Kidney health tips. So the way I answer that is if you don't drink alcohol, don't start drinking it. Uh, there should be no reason. But if you do like a glass of wine here and there, then it's not a problem. If, if, some people say it actually might be good for your heart uh, and good for your kidneys uh, indirectly. So that should be okay. But anything in excess is bad. So, and, and especially if, if they dehydrate you. The other thing that can happen with too much alcohol is liver problems. And liver then indirectly affects the kidneys as well. So the short answer is that limit alcohol intake as much as you can. It also gives you extra calories. The next question, some drugs create high potassium. Can you elaborate more what we should do as there are some drugs that actually, some of these drugs are actually beneficial? So that's another great question. So the drugs that, that I think they're talking about over here is drugs called ACE inhibitors or ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers. Those are, as, as nephrologists, one of our favorite drugs. All of our patients are on those drugs unless there's a good reason. So the drug class, once again, is ACE inhibitors and ARBs. But one of the things that can happen with these drugs is high potassium. So what we try to do is, is if they're high potassium, we do want to maintain or keep them on the medication because the benefits are really humongous. So, so we try to bring down potassium through, through diet. We also give them diuretics. Uh, uh, some of them actually lower potassium. There are also potassium binders that you can put them on. So we try everything that we can to, to, mini, to bring down the potassium and keep them on the medication and actually titrate the medication up. Because most of the benefit of these drugs is get at the higher doses. So the short answer is that if you're having high potassium on these drugs, then talk to your physician and see if there are other things that you can do to bring down the potassium rather than discontinuing. And the last resort is always taking you off these or down tightening the medication, which I personally don't like and most of the experts in this field don't like it either. But if that's the only choice left, then we have to do that. Next question, how often should I see my kidney doctor? So if you are being, being referred to a kidney specialist, that means there is some kidney problems, unless the kidney specialist sends you back saying there is no kidney issue. So if you have some kidney problems, then at the minimum you should be seen every year, one annual checkup. But, but after that, it depends upon what stage you're in. So I mentioned the stage two, three, four, five. And, and um, if you're definitely in stage five, you should be seen very frequently, almost every month. Uh, if you're in stage four, you can be seen every couple of months, depending upon what, what the issues are. Uh, so, so the frequency will depend upon your stage. Once again, that, that underlies the importance of, of the kidney stage you're in. At what kidney stage should I be referred for a transplant? Another good question. So uh, this, and 
the other thing that I would add over here is at what stage should I be sent to for evaluation by a dialysis unit? So for both of them, I would say when your GFR, so once again, the importance of lab tests, when your GFR is below 20, um, I refer my patients automatically, both through the transplant program and to the dialysis unit. The, the whole thing is planning. And our, our goal is to give you as much information as you can, and you can talk to all the healthcare teams and make a decision that suits best your needs. So I think that's that's where, where, where this early referral comes in. Now, when do you get a transplant? Depends upon a lot of factors. If you don't have a living kidney donor, then, then you probably will need to go on dialysis and, and um, and wait for a few years at the minimum before you get a transplant. If you have a potential living donor, then, then you can actually even bypass what we call preemptive kidney transplant. And if you have any questions about how to, to approach for a living kidney donor, I'll be very happy to, to, to talk to you or my team. And also we have other past living kidney donors that also would be very happy to help you out. Okay, the next question is, is a very good one. What does the green ribbon stand for? So. I'm glad this question was asked. So we all know pink ribbon stands for breast cancer. So um, green ribbon and some of my very good friends, Brandy and, and Ravi and a lot of others as well, started this green ribbon campaign. And the, and the purpose of the green ribbon campaign is to increase kidney awareness. Like I said, kidney disease is silent. Most of the patients don't even know they have kidney problems and you have to be proactive about that. So the purpose of the green ribbon campaign is to increase kidney awareness and to provide support to our kidney patients. And, and that's a big part of the core kidney program. And the last question that I'll be taking today is, if my donor has a different blood group, can he still donate? And the answer is yes. So in the past, blood group was important, but now we actually have something called paired exchange. And you probably have seen these chains. So the blood group, as long as the kidney donor is, is actually healthy enough to donate, the blood group should not be a factor. They might not be able to donate to you directly, but they can indirectly donate to you and you'll get the same benefit. So with that, I think uh, my time is up. And thank you very, very much for joining me in this webinar. We have a few more coming up. And if there's any questions you have, I have my contact information. Please email me, visit our website, and also join our core kidney program. Thank you very, very much for, for joining the webinar today.